Welcome back to the factory. We have been doing some production this week. First up, we've gone through some new Globit LED modules. We're finally getting into it. We're, we're manufacturing the new Globit modules, this time with the black WS2812 LEDs, just to remove that visual impact of the white LEDs. A little bit of construction work happening next door, but we're just gonna have to deal with it, so bear with me. Just so you can see now an in the flesh comparison between those LEDs. And I think that for our new line of Globit hardware, this is gonna be a really nice touch. So we've got the four x four matrix, which tiles in one direction very easily. We've got the Globit stick, which tiles in one direction very easily as well. That has eight, that has 16 LEDs. Looking nice, we're testing them right now, we're bagging them, and we should be releasing them pretty soon. Stay tuned. We actually made the call with the 4x4 to remove all the front facing artwork because, you know, all the pin labels are on the back. So we'll just keep that face nice and blank, nice and clean for everyone that wants a very clean display. Mm. And I can tell you that using the new production line equipment is an absolute dream. The really, really big changes were the oven, which now has the rails. So we can go straight from the pick and place machine into the oven with no human interaction. And really importantly, the oven now feeds into the PCB loader. So once that PCB comes out of the oven, it just gets automatically loaded into a cassette, which for panels like these that only take a few minutes, that's a really big deal. Before we'd have to be getting up every couple of minutes just to catch the panel as it comes out of the oven, but now it just gets automatically pushed into a PCB cassette and you'll see that that cassette just indexes down to the next row. And that gives us the capacity for a hundred panels, theoretically a hundred panels without any human interaction, which is, Oh, it's gonna be good. It's been a little while since we've released a PicoDev module. We just released the PicoDev three channel capacitive touch sensor earlier this week, and we're hoping to get out the RGB module very soon, as well as the light sensor. So we'll be doing more productions in the near future. Now here's the thing, putting LEDs on a PCB and soldering them is really the easy part. There's actually a whole, that's, that's probably only a quarter of the effort that goes into making a product like this. Really what's going on behind the scenes with these Globit modules is all the work that Brenton's putting into them to get them really beautiful and easy to use in MicroPython. Things like turning the LED index into an XY coordinate so you can just treat the thing like a screen with XY pixels, getting really pleasing demos together so that your first experience is like really gratifying straight away. You, you can be inspired with what you can do with these modules. And so in his journey in creating these drivers and these examples, Brenton's actually made what I think is a really non-trivial contribution to MicroPython. And that is he's sped up the WS2812 LED driver a lot. It's actually kind of bonkers. We started off with the example that was in the data sheet for the Raspberry Pi Pico, and we've made it at least a couple of times faster. So I'll hand, I'll hand things over to Brenton so he can walk you through his changes. So over the last week, I have been hard at work trying to make Globit.py, the Globit MicroPython driver, uh, to allow you to get started with our Globit products as fast as possible on something like the Raspberry Pi Pico. Now, one of the beautiful things about MicroPython is that it is really, really easy to develop on compared to other programming methods like C or Arduino, but it comes at the cost as mostly being a little bit, a little bit slower or significantly slower depending on what you're doing. So one of the things I've been trying to work out is how to make MicroPython code run as fast as possible. The feature we'll be talking about today is the MicroPython Viper Decorator. Effectively, the MicroPython Viper Decorator will compile a small snippet of MicroPython code, basically just a function that you've written, and it will compile it to the native machine code of the device you're running on. So for the Raspberry Pi Pico we've got here, it will try to compile it to the machine code for the Cortex, the ARM Cortex M0+, Plus, which is an ARM thumb assembly uh, device. So let's look at the code we'll be demonstrating today. It's currently running the demonstration on uh, your right there. Um, we've started with the code that's on the Core Electronics website, um, just in the guide for getting started on the Raspberry Pi Pico with the WS2812, or you know the device that the Globits are made from. Um, and at the bottom of this code, um, I've got some code here that runs the um, runs the demonstration in the background. Um, I don't want to talk too much about how this is working at the moment. The code's a bit rushed and ugly. Um, a more polished version of this is going to be included in the Globit library. I do, however, want to talk about two particular functions. One of them is this draw drop function here, um, which is, as you can see, an unrolled loop, which draws several pixels to the screen 
um, at different XY coordinates. And the other function here, panel transform, which takes an XY coordinate on our three by three tiled matrix here and turns it into the address for that individual pixel. You'll see at the top of these functions, I've got a commented outline that says um, at micropython.viper. This is what's called a micropython decorator. Effectively what's happening here is the MicroPython interpreter is calling a function called Viper and then that function in turn is running the code inside the function that we've written. Um, this is all built into the MicroPython interpreter um, and effectively what this Viper function does is it takes your MicroPython code and compiles it to machine code. It's basically a very basic um, assembly compiler, <laughs> you know, Python to assembly compiler. Um, and down the bottom here, I've got a frames per second counter. At the moment, we're sitting around 10 frames per second, which is going to be fine for a lot of uh, animations, but let's see how fast we can get this to go. Before we actually run it at full speed, we need to talk about a little bit of extra syntax that's been thrown in here. Um, you'll see in the arguments list for this function, we've got this syntax here, which just tells the Viper compiler, or tells Python, that x is going to be an integer. Likewise, our y coordinate is also going to be an integer, and this little bit of syntax on the right here says that the return value will be an integer. This is one of the compromises you need to expect if you want to try to write MicroPython Viper code. You have to specify what the argument data type is. Effectively, it needs to know what the data type of every single variable is or it doesn't know what to do with it. If we scroll down to our draw drop function, it's got exactly the same thing. Um, it's got a self argument because this is actually inside a class. I don't really want to talk about that right now. It's beyond the scope of the video. But the X and Y coordinates that are being passed to it, um, again, they are specified as integers. So let's just quickly run this without um, this commented out. We'll bring in the micropython.viper on that function and we'll bring in the micropython viper there and hit control R to run this. And you'll see straight away, we've jumped from 10 to about 22, 23 frames per second. Um, this varies, it varies with the number of uh, raindrops that are being uh, drawn on the screen, but we've got almost a doubling in speed improvement just by using MicroPython Viper decorators on two of our crucial functions. There's a few things you should probably be aware of before you start jumping in and using MicroPython.Viper everywhere. Um, one is that you can't have default values on your arguments. So if I say that X is by default zero here and try to run that, um, we're going to get an invalid syntax error. We get a syntax error. If you're specifying the data type for a Viper function, you can't specify a default value. Another limit is that the return value can just be, basically it has to be an integer. Um, there's a, two, a few other return values that it supports, um, but you're basically limited to just having a single value being returned. You can't return lists of Python objects or something like that. You can only return single values. Um, and lastly, this is perhaps a huge one for some people, but you can't do what's called emulated floating point operations. If we go, say, down here and say instead of, um, instead of eight that that's an 8.0, that's going to start doing what's called floating point calculations. Okay, the, so floating point calculations is when a large, um, you know, decimal fraction library is brought in because the CPU we're using can't do floating point calculations natively. If we try to run that, we're going to get another error and it says, yeah, we can't do an operation between an integer, which is what this variable MC here is, and object. In this case, it's trying to turn 8.0 into a floating point object. MicroPython.Viper won't let you do that. And lastly, this does break portability with CPython. So if you're writing Python code that's going to run on a Raspberry Pi and on a Raspberry Pi Pico, um, MicroPython.Viper will cause errors when you try to run this um, on your Raspberry Pi. Um, we are developing a workaround for that for the Globit library, so that's, that's going to be okay. You'll be able to see that when that library is released. Um, but for now, just be aware that you're probably going to break portability. Maybe this will work fine on a Pico and it won't work fine on, say, um, an ESP32 based dev board. Um, there's going to be a, little, a few gotchas there. MicroPython.Viper is very much an experimental feature. If it works, great. Um, if it doesn't work, you sort of just have to live without it. If you would like to know more about how to use the micropython.viper decorator, or as the documentation calls it, the code emitter, we'll, we'll leave a link to the documentation in the description below. We've also been assembling our PicoDev OLED module, and this is probably the most challenging module to date. It actually requires a hand assembly step. The final step in the process after we pick and place the boards, we run them through the oven, we clean them, we dry them. There's still one more process to do before testing, which is to solder on the OLED module and then tape it down in place and then test. 
And so this is a manual operation for now. There, there are machines that will do this, but man, it's, it's such a, at the moment, it's such a niche application soldering this 30 pin flat flex cable that for now we're doing it by hand with like this T-bar soldering tip. So we solder that in place in a jig that we made just out of some FR4, and then we tape the OLED module down and test it in our jig. And that's just a test pattern where we illuminate every pixel and then just like remove or print in black PicoDev just so we know that the data that's coming through is sensible. It's not just blanking white for some other reason. So we're working through all our productions on PicoDev, Globit, Makerverse, and that means that you ought to see a bunch of juicy new hardware hitting the website very soon. Stay tuned. So there you have it, a bunch of new hardware goodies and some major, major improvements to the MicroPython WS2812 drivers. If you have any questions or if you just want to have a chat, open a thread in the Core Electronics forums. And until next time, thanks for watching. Thank you.